and welcome to Talks at Google. My name is Nicholas Whitaker. I'm a GPOS volunteer at Google and wellness champion. And I have the real pleasure to welcome Amishi Jha and Eric B. Schoomaker to discuss how, com how to combat VUCA, volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity, a concept introduced by the Ar US Army War College to describe the more volatile, uncertain, and complex and ambiguous multilateral world perceived as resulting from the end of the cold world. It's a concept that can be readily applied to the corporate organization or anyone navigating the changing dynamics of a global pandemic or the growing complexities of a global security. In this session, we will talk about the realities of managing VUCA and the role that mindfulness and compassion play in building great teams, as well as the impact of these practices on well being. I'd like to introduce Dr. Amishi Jha. She's an associate professor of psychology at the University of Miami and director of contemplative neuroscience for the Mindfulness Research and Practice Initiative, whose research centers on attention, working memory, and mindfulness. She received her PhD from the University of California, Davis, and received her postdoctoral training at the Brain Imaging and Analysis Center at Duke University in functioning neuroimaging. Jaw studies the neural basis of attention and the effects of mindfulness-based training programs on cognition, emotion, and resilience. With grants from the Department of Defense and several private foundations, she has been systematically investigating the applications of mindfulness training and education, corporate, elite sports, first responders, and military contexts. In addition to her own published body of research, her work has been featured in many outlets, including TED.com, NPR, and Mindful Magazine, as well as prior Talks at sessions. She has also been invited to present her work to NATO, the UK Parliament, the Pentagon, and the World Economic Forum. Welcome, Dr. Jha. Thank you very much. I'd also like to introduce and welcome uh, Eric B. Schoomaker, currently serving as Senior Physician Consultant for the Department of Veterans Affairs in the implementation of Veterans Whole Health. After 32 years of active service, Lieutenant General retired Eric B. Schoomaker served as the 42nd U.S. Army Surgeon General and Commanding General of the U.S. Army Medical Command. His principal interests are twofold, complementary and integrative health and medicine, emphasizing mindfulness and the shifts from disease management focused healthcare systems to one more centered on the improvement and sustainment of health and well-being and leadership education. Dr. Schoomaker is an internal medicine physician with a PhD in human genetics. In uniform, he held many assignments, including command of the Walter Reed Army Medical Center in Washington, DC, the Army's Medical Research and Material Command at Fort Detrick, Maryland, an Army Academic Medical Center, a community hospital, a deployable medical brigade, and two Army Regional Medical Commands. Over the past decade, he has been collaborating with Dr. Ja on research studies and active duty military service members and military spouses. Welcome, Eric, and thank you for your service. Well, thanks very much. Uh, it's a privilege to be here, Nicholas. And with that, I'd like to, first of all, just welcome you both. Thank you so much for being here today. I've been very much looking forward to this talk. This is a subject matter of great interest to me, but also for the entire company. And I think a lot of folks today during this very, very strange role that we're moving through. I'd like to kind of just start off up at the top at the very basics and Amishi, maybe kind of turn to you and let's talk a little bit about what is attention and why does it matter? Great question. And yeah, I just wanted to say thank you to the GPOS team and to Talks at Google. It's fun to be here. And thank you, Eric, a real privilege to get to do this together. So attention is a very, very big um, topic and brain system in some sense. And in my lab, we, we study this brain system by looking at um, things like functional brain imaging and um, brainwave recordings and we're really interested in understanding how it works in the brain, right? How it's organized, what brain systems are involved. But after doing this for many years, what we realized is that, well, the obvious thing we knew from the get-go is a very, very powerful system. We need it for almost every single thing we do. And we can talk about kind of how that plays into things like leadership and performance. But what we noticed that kind of struck us was that even though it's so powerful, it's actually quite vulnerable. And in particular, it's vulnerable to kind of the three very common things that we all experience as human beings, stress, threat, and poor mood. And when we encounter these kinds of circumstances, attention declines, it gets degraded. So from my point of view, knowing something is very powerful yet vulnerable puts me in a position as a scientist to wanna figure out 
what I can possibly do about it. And that's actually where mindfulness training and our work with the military uh, came in as a brain training or cognitive training tool to see if we could actually offer practices very much like the kinds of practices that GPAWS uh, allows and offers employees at Google um, to strengthen and protect this very precious and vulnerable brain resource. So yeah, I think we could talk about what actually attention is as we kind of move forward. But the most important thing to know is that it it really biases everything else the brain does, uh, all of its information processing and um, the way that it perceives and makes decisions. Oh, you're on mute. Always the important part to unmute. <laughs> and Eric, uh, really kind of curious of your crossover. And first of all, like, how did you and Amishi first get connected? And how did this play out in the work that you do? Well, I mean, you, um, your audience heard her credentials. Who wouldn't want to work with Amishi Ja? Quite frankly, she's a remarkable, remarkable uh, person um, uh, as a scientist and as a practical thinker in translational science. Um, I've had a long-standing interest in mindfulness. Um, it's really fundamental to a lot of the work that is done both in the U.S. military, but also in, in medicine. And uh, we met um, a number of years ago uh, through our academic co uh, connections and, and I think uh, realized we had a very strong uh, mutual uh, interest in, in this issue of attention, as I mean, she has outlined and uh, the prevailing problem of mindlessness, meaning the inability to focus that attention and maintain that focus. Um, I have seen it um, in my own life with my own concerns. I mean, you just heard her describe it's a, the effects of, uh, of stress and mood um, on these, uh, sleeplessness and or sleep deprivation and others. And the, the, these are the conditions that surround um, the members of the military almost on a continuous basis and certainly in medicine, nursing and other uh, related fields. So um, we've come together and, and I'm very, very supportive along with uh, many other um, prominent members of the military community and not just uh, physicians like myself of, of her work. And I'm sure we'll get into this in more detail, but I'm curious just up the top, you know, Eric, you know, any specific stories or any kind of uh, descriptions of how this type of mindfulness practice and this type of research has really impacted the way that troops operate? Yeah, I'm going to tell a story that I think captures the essence of what we're talking about here. Um, and this story goes back to 2003. Um, uh, there was at the time a, a, a young lieutenant colonel, um, battalion commander of a battalion in the 101st Airborne Division out of Fort Campbell, Kentucky. And he was involved in the initial takedown of Baghdad in uh, Operation Iraqi Freedom. And he was tasked to take a, a, a group of soldiers and protect uh, a very, very important sacred site uh, for the Shia Muslim population um, the Ali Shrine in Najaf. Um, it's said to be the burial site of Adam and of Noah. And he was to, to also protect the Grand Ayatollah Sistani who had been um, at odds with um, Saddam Hussein, had been under house arrest under Saddam Hussein. So the arrangements were made for him to take a, a, a team of about 200 very well-armed uh, soldiers and, uh, and to uh, provide protection and ensure his safety and the safety of the mosque. It had been prearranged and, and it started off very well that day. Um, but as they got closer and closer, Ba'athist um, provocateurs within the crowd began to, to um, uh, incite um, essentially a riot, telling them that no, the, the American soldiers were on their way to destroy the mosque and to, to do harm to the Ayatollah. And uh, the crowd turned very quickly violent and began throwing rocks and set up a circumstance. I mean, 200 sleep deprived. They hadn't slept for two to three days. They were sleep deprived. They were under enormous stress. They were outnumbered by this crowd, um, uh, you know, significantly, but very heavily armed. This could be a, a bloodbath. And, and, and uh, Chris Hughes did an remarkable thing. He first, he, he must have examined himself in his, in his, emotional state and the and and it 
and the emotional state of his soldiers, knowing his soldiers well, and, and sensed what the crowd was going through. And he turned to his soldiers and he said, listen, uh, what I want you to do is I want you to invert your weapons. I want you to take a knee and I want you to smile at the crowd. And then he turned to the crowd and he inverted his own weapon, uh, took a knee and then gave the sign with his right hand over his heart of peace. And the crowds immediately began to calm and began to smile back at him. And then he told his soldiers, let's back out. It's obvious that the Ayatollah is safe at this point and the mosque is preserved. Let's ex exit the scene. And that is the essence of mindfulness. That's the essence of understanding context. It's, it's really the exercise of one of the best examples of emotional intelligence I've ever seen. And what is that about? But, but to understand self, to understand all the components that are going into judgment, to not get spun up in some stereotypical reflexive you know, response that could have resulted in a, a, a horrific day. Um, that is an example of the kind of mindfulness that we're trying to generate. Uh, that's a wonderful th story. Thanks for sharing that, Eric. And I'm, I'm curious, either for both of you, maybe this is a question for Amishi, like what are the core skills that we're really kind of teaching troops here uh, that we're seeing being put into play within an environment like that? Yeah, I think to, to start us off, I mean, it goes back to what we were saying regarding attention. And, you know, I think a, maybe a metaphor for what attention is may be helpful here. Often I describe attention sort of like a flashlight, the way you'd use in a darkened room or a darkened pathway, right? Wherever it is that that flashlight is directed, we have privileged access to that information. And that can be used not only to survey the external environment, as we just heard in the example given, where uh, the leader needed to be able to understand what was happening in the present moment, but to also turn that flashlight inward to understand how he himself was feeling uh, and to point it toward the others, right? The others that are in the uh, environment or uh, his own team. So I think that that flashlight um, is very, very powerful. It connects to another brain uh, system or brain capacity called working memory that always works hand in hand with attention. And we can think of working memory as sort of the brain's whiteboard or the cache in your computer. It keeps information that we need um, to have access to really fast and accurately, and it's constantly updating based on what those needs are. So it ends up that both attention and working memory together are something uh, described as executive functions. And, and we use the term uh, executive very much like the executive of companies, right? It's, it's having this power to enact action. And so that those capacities, those executive capacities are one kind of aspect of what gets strengthened as a function of, of mindfulness training. It ends up that, that executive functions are not just needed for the cognitive, right? Our ability to think, uh, plan, problem solve, make decisions, but it's needed for the, the interpersonal or social domain or connected domain, uh, negotiating, communicating, um, even managing conflict, just like the example that we were, we were talking about. And then finally, we need executive functions for the regulation of our own emotions. So if we think about it, that's a pretty big swath of what we need as human beings. And mindfulness training is able to strengthen this core capacity of attention and working memory. So all of those functions benefit. That's sort of one side of the, the coin, or if you will, of what mindfulness training does. There is a whole other aspect, which I think we should talk about, that has to do not so much with directing and controlling attention and action, but observing and noticing and watching, um, which are also extremely powerful. And as we, as in this beautiful example, Eric just mentioned, those are constantly going back and forth. You need to be able to do something, but you need to reflect on what's being done. In some sense, you need to know where that flashlight is pointing and you need to know what, uh, what is on the whiteboard to really be able to take uh, the most wise action you can. And I think that's such a beautiful metaphor too. this idea of a flashlight, you know, and, and being able to kind of point it in any one direction at a time. Is this something that we can point in multiple things at the same time? Or is it truly like a flashlight where we have to have it at one thing? We think we can. We all think we can. Right. I can be on this on this uh, program right now and be checking my email and planning my next grant. And uh, if only we had 10 flashlights to do that. Right. And that's sort of the modern world we live in, where multitasking is the norm. 
and we put ourselves in, in positions where we're constantly asking our mind to do this. But no, in fact, the, there is really only one flashlight and that flashlight can only be directed uh, to one thing. And so if we try to, or if we feel that we're actually multitasking, what we're actually doing is task switching. We're pointing that flashlight, mm -hmm. you know, we're directing it, we have a certain amount of information coming in and then we're disengaging it to move to the next thing. And, you know, as we talk about vulnerabilities um, for the attention system, this is a big one. We deplete this precious brain resource by having ourselves multitask over and over again. And imagine, especially in a combat environment or in a high stress environment like a corporation, that can be a very difficult thing to, to try to put into practice is like the task switching uh, very quickly, for example. And I'm curious, maybe Eric, you know, within a combat zone or within a conflict area, you know, in our prior talks, you know, leading up to this conversation, one of the things that really struck me that you said is that it's not really the enemy that's the most dangerous thing. In, in these environments, what is the most dangerous thing? Well, I, before before we get into that, I just want to reinforce what Amishi just said about this myth of multitasking. That it, it's actually rapid serial unitaxing. And I think there are enough studies to know, and Amishi, correct me if I'm wrong, that at the end of the day, one plus one plus one is something less than three. We don't do any of those tasks as well. And unfortunately, in a sleep-deprived state, especially in, in others, there's a perception that you're doing very well when in fact you're not. And that really characterizes much of the environment you're describing, uh, uh, Nick. So, so uh, that quote that, I, that you had from me was actually given to me by someone, who, a, a very experienced soldier who had been in many, many conflict zones and many, many firefights. And being a physician who really spent much more time preserving life and saving these guys then, uh, and taking care of you know, civilian casualties and the like, and even enemies, I, uh, I, I wanted to know what was it like out there? And, and the response was, well, you know, it, it, this may surprise you, but the enemy is often not the most dangerous thing on the battlefield. It's weather, it's being run over by a, by a tank. It's, it's the fact that everybody else on your side is also armed. And so we have so-called fratricide events where, where soldiers kill soldiers. And, uh, and the like, um, and it and it's so similar to um, the, uh, the parallels in medicine. This is one of the reasons I'm also very interested. In. You know, 20 years ago, the Institute of Medicine, now the National Academy of Medicine, did a, a landmark study a, a, about safety in the American healthcare system, and and noted that for over a hundred thousand people are killed in hospitals in, in the country every year. Basically, the equivalent of a crash of a jumbo jet every three days because of these problems of systemic inattention. You know, there's a movement now, a very important one, a transformation into highly reliability, high reliability organizations to focus attention of the individuals and teams. Um, so you've been in situations, you, you probably know of situations in which an operating room team, very proficient, very practiced, may operate on the wrong leg, may take out the wrong organ, may leave a sponge in place, which is a, a big, basically, piece of gauze. And you wonder, how does that happen? And how that happens often is, is, is inattention. And so this effort, and one of the solutions to this is mindfulness. How can we get people focused on the present and not th be thinking about the last problem that they had, maybe still rumbling in their mind, that flashlight has diverted to a rearward uh, uh, direction, or wondering about the next case, or wondering about the next meal, or wondering about who knows what, you know. Uh, the flashlight is now focused on the future, and they're not present-minded. I imagine in the best of times, you know, being focused and being attentive is difficult for people that perhaps don't have training in, in mindfulness. And I'm curious, you know, in our current uh, environment, whether, whether it be in the military or in a corporate environment or just in our daily lives, there's a lot of what is called VUCA occurring. And I thought perhaps we could talk a little bit about what VUCA is within the military context and how that perhaps applies to what maybe a lot of us are experiencing now. Well, well, VUCA, as you pointed out, was was generated, it was begun after the Cold War, after this notion that, that we had a kind of uh, um, 
um, you know, unidirectional um, um, approach to problem solving in a military environment, but that that environment, which was linear, which was contiguous, where we had a front and a rear, where we had a combat zone and a non-combat zone, it suddenly became disrupted by the present realities. Going back even before 9-11 and the takedown of, of the Pentagon and the, and the towers, when, when irregular forces, when small cells uh, were using asymmetric methods of attacking democracies and, and, and the US, um, even on the battlefield today, it's not a continuous, contiguous battlefield. There is no front and rear. People who once expected that they would go to battle and be like in a World War II setting where there was a very large logistical tail in this asymmetrical discontinuous battlefield, the rear becomes the point of attack for an asymmetrical force who's not gonna take on you know, an overwhelming force at the point of the spear. So it's volatile, it's uncertain, it's highly complex and it's ambiguous. Uh, where cause and effect is occurring is hard to do, hard to discern. And this has become part of the business community. If, you, if your viewers don't know about it, the uh, Harvard Business Review in the January, February 2014 issue actually have a, has an article by Bennett and company about VUCA, what it means in the business environment. And you can go online as well, Google um, uh, Harvard Business Review review in September 5th of 2014. And there's a talk about the VUCA environment in the business community. So this has become now very commonplace. And I think uh, uh, part of the, you know, the, the uh, lexicon of the business world. And I think that just to follow up on what Eric said, I think it's very, uh, very much relevant to our current moment and what happens in the workplace setting as well, uh, tied to the current moment, right? So if we, if we look back at this notion of attention and the, the metaphor I provided of the flashlight, when we experience volatility, uncertainty, complexity, ambiguity, often what happens is we get into a mental time traveling mode. And you know, he, as Eric was saying a few minutes ago, so it's like the flashlight has been yanked back in time. And I'm certainly very aware of this in my own mind, you know, with the holidays approaching, just what is normal and comfortable. Typically when we have, uh, difficulty and challenge, we kind of cherish the familiar, right? We, we look forward to it. It's a source of, of comfort and we look back on that. Uh, now we might be at a point where things are so weird, uh, where you know, going to see a family member is like this high stress thing that you may or may not choose to do, uh, that we begin ruminating and sort of reliving in an unproductive way of the contrast between what used to happen and what we're dealing with now. Or we take that flashlight and we fast forward to worrying and, and catastrophizing about all the things that we don't know. I think there's two things that are very interesting as it relates to, to VUCA and attention. Um, one thing, again, related to COVID for sure, is that mortality salience actually depletes attention. And we do these studies very simply by even asking people to think about their own mortality and then having them do an attentionally demanding task they're toast. They're, ter they're terrible at it. <laughs> it makes sense, right? It's a very preoccupying thing, which I think every day you cannot scroll on any kind of platform without being faced with what this is, with our numbers rising and with this affecting all of us and all of our communities. So, you know, it's a really big issue. The other one that is, I think, tied to the, the specific impact on attention is uncertainty. And so in the lab, we do this in a very kind of innocuous way. Uh, people come in and we say, okay, you're going to do an experiment now. But just so you know, at the end of the experiment, um, we may ask you to give a speech. <laughs> and and that's it, right? So one group is completely unaware, uncertain about whether they're going to give a speech or not. If we compare that condition to conditions in which they're told 100% for sure you're giving a speech or 100% you're not going to give a speech, the uncertain group is the one that really suffers the most in terms of their performance. And that's sort of what the moment is, are, is the vaccine going to work? When are we going to get it? What group am I in? You know, what about my parents? What about when will we return back to work? All of these issues, I think, add to what we're experiencing. And often we we feel this. We feel this sense of cognitive fog. Um, yet, you know, most of us are still working and engaged and doing our, our professional, engaging in our professional lives. 
But we have to take seriously that that depletion from the ongoing onslaught of this moment is not a figment of our imagination. It actually is depleted brain resources. And frankly, it turns back to the topic that we're talking about today where mindfulness can play a role. And I just want to say how grateful I am that organizations like Google and people like you, uh, Nick, who are really leading the charge with, with the corporate context, allowing people to volunteer to provide mindfulness to their fellow employees. I think it's absolutely a lifeline. Um, and I'm very glad that it's happening in a giant organization like Google. Yeah, I, if I could, if I could just respond also, uh, Nick, I, take everything that Anisha just said and put it in the context of that first responder mm -hmm. or that that team that's taking care of COVID patients right now. Uh, suddenly, the world is upside down for them. Um, they're in a constant state of threats to their own life. And, and, and caregivers have always been in that situation. I mean, some of the last people to die of smallpox were mm -hmm. physicians in England and nurses in England who took care of smallpox immigrants coming into the, into the UK. Um, we, uh, HIV disease, tuberculosis, you name it, we're always uh, under threat. But not to the degree that we're seeing right now. Uh, we haven't seen this degree of threat really since HIV or before. And uh, so they're constantly preoccupied with is what, what Amishi said with her own mortality. It has to be a part of their, their everyday work. They're physically and emotionally exhausted. Um, those who have drawn the, core, the, 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 the association between uh, battling COVID and war, I think are absolutely right. We are in a war against this virus and its effects on society. Uh, and we don't wear body armor, we don't wear helmets, we don't uh, have bot, you know, goggles, but in fact we do. We, we have, the, our body armor is our masks and, and gowns and, and protective goggles. Uh, face, face, face protection. Uh, we face an uncertain, ambiguous uh, enemy that we can't measure uh, very effectively right now. Um, and we're even seeing the results of this combat result in the loss of life where people like soldiers on a battlefield often die alone and mm -hmm. they die without their families. Um, this is in such parallel. This is what Barbara Tuckman described in her book, The Distant Mirror, about the great, the great pandemics of bubonic plague. This is, the, this is recreation of the yellow fever pandemics of Philadelphia and New York and the Gulf Coast. And, and, and it is a war uh, and, and it's distracting people, unfortunately, from all too often the attention that they have to direct to the things they want to direct attention to, to include their own families when they get some time back home. And Eric, when we were kind of talking in preparation for this uh, this event, you had this really interesting quote, uh, which I'm paraphrasing, but essentially you said something along the lines of mindfulness is a fundamental human skill is something that we've underdeveloped. It's a shame that we don't really learn this until we are adults, if we're lucky. I thought maybe we could just speak to that a little bit and what inspired that. Well, I think Amishi has is, is, is got a better grasp of how, how this relates to other species, but I, I, I've come to wonder personally, if this is not a very uniquely human skill that we have, the ability to, to, draw, to, to draw a cause and effect, to, to have narrative, and then to be mindful of how to use information in a focused way to make decisions really distinguishes our success as humans in the long history of, of human development and uh, the, the emergence of the species. Uh, it is a fundamental skill. Awareness. We know that we have awareness. We know that We've always had that voice in the back of their heads that said, hey, I'm thinking. I'm, I'm saying that I mean, they could step back almost as a third party and, and be aware of what was happening, even as your own voice is saying something different. Um, but we, I don't think we were ever trained how to use that. But we can be trained how to use that. We can, we can be trained as to how those other thoughts, that whether they are generated from the the, the past or the future or, or other parallel interests that you have right now. I get, again, I go back to the, I go back to the, uh, you know, the nurse practitioner, physician, PA in an office with a patient. How many of us have gone to the doctor and, and felt like the doctor wasn't paying attention to us? It wasn't listening to our story. 
Well, what were they thinking about? They were thinking about the last patient. They were thinking about how long this is going to go on today. Mm -hmm. They were thinking about, are they behind? They're thinking about, you know, who knows what? And that distraction, that inability to focus their flashlight on you is, uh, has made this a, a less than optimal interaction for you, the patient, and for them, the caregiver, quite frankly, because they're aware that there's something that they might be leaving out that's going to carry over to the next patient. And imagine a lot of us, you know, while we might not be in life-threatening situations or in careers or, or job categories where we're actually saving lives, which are a lot of one of the ones that you just you listed, a lot of us are obviously dealing with our own responsibilities, our own uh, responsibilities of leadership. And Amishi, I'm, I'm curious, you had a, a phrase that you had used previously of attention is the currency of leadership in our moment. And I was wondering maybe we could just speak to that a little bit as well. Absolutely. just don't want to... Um take credit for that phrase, I actually borrowed it from Ron Heifetz, who is a, an MBA professor at Harvard Business School. I think it's a great way to think about attention. We already think about attention as a currency in some sense, right? We pay attention, um, attention gets grabbed, um, et cetera, but it really does relate to leadership. And I think that has to do with what I already described in some sense of all these dimensions that attention fuels. So our ability to think, for example, or connect or feel. And we know it when we have a, an attentive physician or an attentive leader, uh, we know what that feels like to be the recipient of that attention. And we also know what it feels like to not be the recipient of that, of that attention. And I think that, you know, going back to what Eric was saying a moment ago regarding this fundamental capacity, this intrinsic capacity to be mindful, I think it is something we definitely have. In fact, anything the brain can do is already built into the brain. It's just a matter of strengthening certain circuits so that it happens more reliably and on cue. And there's sort of two big things that um, can derail us. And this has to do with all of us, including leaders, as leaders and, and as people that have to interface with other people that are our leaders. Uh, the first is this propensity to mind wander. So we may want to be present to what's happening. We may really want to, especially you know, after hearing maybe a, a talk like this, you're like, I wanna pay attention. But the, the data are clear, 50% of our waking moments, we're not where our task is telling us we, we need to be, right? If you're trying to write an email, you're kind of touch and go half the time, just even trying to generate that email. If you're at the meeting, same thing, having a conversation, same idea. So mind wandering or having off task thoughts during an ongoing, task um, or activity, it's just, it's so prevalent. So wishing for it to be present isn't enough. And the second is that we believe our thoughts. We forget that thoughts aren't reality. It's just a mental event that's mm -hmm. occurred in your mind. And with both of those, sometimes what happens with regard to leadership and attention is that we go from the sort of successful leader who is focused connected and balanced, emotionally balanced, to the not so great side of the leadership puzzle, which is distracted, mm. uh, disconnected and dysregulated. And here's the bad news regarding attention as the currency of leadership. You know, in some sense, because we know attention is so powerfully important, we know that we're gonna select leaders. There's a pressure to have really good attention uh, for people to rise to the, to the level of being a leader. Um, but all people, including leaders, will have their attention depleted. These moments of mind wandering will increase. These moments of falling into believing that everything you think is true will increase. And high stress circumstances are gonna promote that. So no matter what, um, knowing kind of how, how incredibly powerful it is again, and knowing its vulnerability, we need to keep the kind of um, training component alive so that in the face of increasing, increasing challenges, we can still lead effectively. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and just kind of riffing off a little bit of what you had mentioned earlier, this idea that corporations and organizations at scale are actually starting to implement mindfulness training and, and in some cases what they call attention training uh, within these environments. And, you know, I think one of the things I'd like to maybe untangle a little bit is for folks that maybe are bristle with the idea of mindfulness or maybe don't quite understand what mindfulness is specifically. Maybe they think it's, oh, just meditating in a dark room or, you know, 
lighting incense or like whatever that might be, maybe more on the spiritual side of things. You know, what is mindfulness in this environment from your perspective? And how does that, how would you actually define that to somebody that was interested in saying, hey, I'd, I'd really be able to be, I'd really like to be a more mindful leader, but what does that actually mean? I mean, I'll say something, but then I think I want to hear from Eric on this too. Um, the first thing is that it is a form of cognitive training. And the training exercise routine is pretty straightforward, just like CrossFit or something else you might do. There are a set of exercises uh, that you should do with regularity. And those exercises are really uh, promoting your practice with taking that flashlight, uh, watching where it is to see if it's being yanked in the future or the, the past, uh, and then really understanding and, and, and practicing redirecting it to the present. Typically we do this with something as innocuous as paying attention to the breath, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that's just one example of, of how to do it is to engage in these practices. And then of course, the other way to do it is to connect it with our everyday activities. Uh, so that now when you're sitting quietly in your office or at home, you might practice with focusing on the breath, but now in the context of a meeting, the focus isn't your breath, it's the other person you're speaking with. And you're gonna notice when your mind wanders away and return it. So it's not about simply, I mean, I think that people can do it for a variety of reasons and it, it can have a multitude of benefits, right? We're talking about uh, practices that are from the world's wisdom traditions. They've been around forever for fulfilling and enriching our lives. But now with the modern workplace context, they don't have to be necessarily separate and apart from our lived day-to-day -day high power engagement in our work. But Eric, I'd love to hear what you have to say about this. Well, I, I mean, mindfulness, uh, Nick, has been defined by multiple people. I mean, John Kabat-Zinn, when he was at the University of uh, Massachusetts, um, you know, and started his institute, really first focused on people with cardiovascular disease and eventually realized that that having a mindful um, uh, skill um, uh, promoted uh, all kinds of re stress reductions, and he's really the inventor, so to speak, of mindfulness-based stress reduction. Um, and he defines it as, you know, paying attention in the present moment without judgment. Uh, meaning, to go back to something that is often a myth, even the experienced meditator, e even the, the Dalai Lama himself would tell you, I've, I've meditated most of my life, my mind still wanders. Meditation and mindfulness does not clear the mind. I don't know that the mind is ever cleared, except perhaps when you're unconscious. And I don't mean sleeping either. I mean, it's really unconscious and archetized. And so uh, this, what we know is even the, the mindful individual who has a practiced uh, meditative um, experience is going to have mind wandering. The issue is, do you recognize that your mind is wandering? Do you see its impact on you? And do you, are you able to just gently sweep it to the corners of your, of your consciousness without judgment and without dwelling on it? Come back to the, bring your flashlight back to the center stage of your attention. And, and that's what mindfulness, it's not a, it, it, it has been practiced as Amishi says, by large numbers of different spiritual groups. Thomas Merton was studying it as a as a monastic uh, Catholic, and in fact died on a, tragically in a trip studying Buddhist um, monastic uh, meditators in the Far East. Um, but that doesn't make it synonymous with spirituality, and it doesn't need to be thought of in that sense. You know, it um, it is a neuroscientific phenomenon. And it strikes me too that you know, based on Amishi, what you were just mentioning a little while ago, that we spend so much of our time distracted in this kind of mind wandering state. It almost seems to me that mindfulness is a bit of a disruptive element within this kind of like natural state that we tend to find ourselves in. And I'm curious, like, how does that actually impact the way we see or reframe our experiences of the moment? I think that's a great, great way to think about it, this disruptive component. It's, and I always think of it as a, some kind of force multiplier. Mm. Um, but the, I think the first point that you said regarding we spend a lot of our time in this kind of distracted malaise, right? And it's true. I mean, that one of the papers by uh, my colleagues at uh, Harvard who studied mind wandering, that was the title of their paper. A wandering mind is an unhappy mind. And it's mm -hmm. sort of, a, we know that now. But I want to be clear on something. So first of all, having the mind go where it will 
in this sort of spontaneous free flow of our conscious experience is very powerful and very good for us. It's only a problem when we're trying to get something done. When we need to be focused on something and we get pulled away, it can be problematic and actually can be very problematic. We can miss what's happening in our perceptual environment. We can make errors and of course our mood can tank. So, but I did want to mention that because part of being mindful in some sense is knowing when you need to keep the reins on your attention and actually when to not keep the reins on your attention. And I think in our modern world, in our very technologically full world, sometimes we forget that other part. When's the last time, and most of us probably aren't going to the grocery store or anywhere all that often these days, but I can't remember a time when I was standing in line somewhere and I didn't have my phone out. Mm -hmm. And it's not that you shouldn't have your phone out. There are things to do. But if there are opportunities you can take to let your mind go where it will, spontaneous thought, it can be very powerful. So just keep that in mind and take those moments to do that. In terms of why it can be and how it can be disruptive, I think this is where, again, um, it's the two sides of the coin of mindfulness. On the one hand, it's being directive and being better able to know where you're, actually being better able to control your attention, kind of get it back on track, but also to notice where it is. Mm -hmm. And this is what I'd call this sort of um, uh, observational function that we have. And I always like to think of like sort of in the, in the context of, uh, in the context of soldiers, we could say there's a soldier and then there's the sentinel and you need both to have a successful um, time as a, as a warrior or in the context of somebody like a pilot, right? The pilot is maybe flying uh, the plane. She's directing the plane, but you need the air traffic controller to be surveilling the environment uh, to ensure that, that everything's on track. We need to be constantly flipping between these two modes. And again, the observational mode, this what we call meta awareness, mm -hmm. aware of our awareness we just don't have ready access to that. And that's why these practices can be so powerful so that we're not just hearing, we're, we're listening, right? And we're not just reacting, we're really responding. It takes a fullness and awareness of what's happening to do that. Um, so the disruptive piece is that it um, brings into the fold the value of what looks like you're doing nothing or the being mode, if you will, uh, which seems sort of, the most useless thing you might do. Why would you sit around and do nothing? Well, in fact, if you don't let your mind be in that mode, whatever you do is likely to be misguided, misinformed, or at least uh, potentially off track. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it strikes me too, you know, a lot of folks who are high performers or in high stress environments or have high expectations in terms of what they're supposed to be delivering for their job or whatever the, the situation might be, the tendency might be to do more, right, to, to focus harder, to, to spend more time versus say more of this maybe open awareness, a more spacious way of being. I often like to liken it to going to the gym. Like you could go to the gym, you lift the weights, but you also need recovery and rest that's built into this as well. And I'm curious, Amishi and even Eric, you know, in your experience, like how do you see this kind of more rest, recovery, open awareness uh, component fall into place in terms of how are you enabling uh, employees or soldiers or whoever it might be to find ways to actually put this into their daily lives? Like what, what does that look like tactically? Well, I, I mean, I can make some comment about that. I, and, and by the way, I think it's kind of interesting that we think of mindfulness as being sort of a, a disruptor. I, I guess it is a disruptor of the commonplace, but the true disruption is is that we as human beings too often, and this is one of the reasons I got very interested in this as a retiring general officer, is looking back on my own career and saying, how could I have done better in these mm -hmm. circumstances? And it was very clear that had I been more mindful and been more, more skilled in mindfulness, I would have number one, been focused better. I've been ne less emotionally and physically exhausted. Hey, the, the stresses are there. They're gonna be there. This is not a panacea to get rid of stress. But much of the stress is self-created internally. And if I could have been more attentive to how that was being self-created and working through these nonsensical um, you know, scenarios that, or regrets and guilts that I didn't need to, um, I think I could have made it easier for myself. The other is, I think the true disruption comes from the fact that dysfunctional behaviors arise from this. I think people overwhelmed by stress overwhelmed by the inability to focus as they want to, uh, 
and 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 still consumed by the demands of their work, they began doing dysfunctional things. Mm -hmm. They overeat, they overdrink, they use drugs, they oversex. They do things as relievers of the stress that, you know, they that that, that is unforgiving and unrelenting mm -hmm. in, in their lives. Um, and I think that's that's some of the things that uh, it does for you. I think some practical things. I have a friend who's a physician who knowing that he, going from room to room to room to examine a patient and talk to patients, knows that he has the tendency to drag one patient into the next and be dis and unmindful of them. He knocks three times on the door for the next patient to be permitted entry. And he says, I do it three times because the three knocks reminds me of the chime that starts and ends a meditative session. So he resets the conditions before he goes into the to the next room, those are th I think starting every meeting, when possible, with a small mindful exercise mm -hmm. to get everybody in the room focused on what the present goal is, so that we aren't distracted by other things that have been brought in. And we we know we've all been in those situations before. I think there are many different practical things that can be done uh, to build on a disciplined practice of mindfulness. It's a, a very reminiscent description that you're giving there, this idea of like going from meeting to meeting to meeting. You know, I think a lot of times in the corporate environment, this is essentially what our environment is. It's these little 30-minute yeah. breaks back to back with, or, or meetings, I should say, back to back with no breaks in between. And a lot of the distraction or a lot of the feelings or thought processes from the prior meeting bleed into the next. And then we're never really quite present to that meeting at hand. And then we feel perhaps that we're becoming overwhelmed by the amount of things we're trying to keep in our cognition. And I'm curious, you know, either from a corporate environment or elsewhere, like how do you scale this up? You know, on an individual level, we can practice mindfulness, we can practice meditation or attention training, but how does it scale up to an organizational level? I think that's a, the really, a really important question. And I just want to mention, um, again, I see Google as a leader in some sense of, of really starting this off. I, I belong on the board of directors of the Search Inside Yourself Leadership Institute. And this moment to arrive practice, I think is so powerful. Um, so that, and I actually I mentioned it to people like Eric and my colleagues in the military, because I think it's just a reset practice essentially. So that once you start the meeting, you begin by actually being there. Let your attention and all the momentum catch up. So there's the sort of, Building it into the way the work the work day um, looks, acknowledging these tendencies of mind, I think, is very powerful. But you know, the broader question regarding implementation and scalability is actually what my lab has been up to for for the last ten years or so. Once we did our initial studies and found that offering mindfulness training to infantry to to soldiers is beneficial, uh, the next question became, okay, now how do we scale this up to give it to a hundred thousand, two hundred thousand people? And at that point, you know, I was uh, I had one collaborator who was our trainer who had developed the program. And so it was not a very well scalable solution. And so over the last decade in trying to answer that question for, for my own research purposes and also to give the DOD and the Army an answer, uh, we've been pursuing a systematic series of, of studies. And what we've done here is really try to think about sort of a standard mindfulness training program, something like starting with mindfulness-based stress reduction, uh, but contextualized for the military context. You know, mindfulness-based stress reduction is a fantastic program that has a lot of evidence, but it's also quite long for time pressure groups. About 24 plus hours over eight weeks, 45 minutes a day of practice. So one of the questions we asked is, well, what components are necessary? Because we're gonna have to cut time. What do we absolutely need to keep in a, in a program uh, for people to see benefits? And the benefits we were looking for in my lab were things like attention and mood, and even operational performance with some of our collaborators. Um, and what we found is actually interesting in the context of giving this talk, I'm humble to say this, but what we found is that if you're in a mindfulness training program and you talk about how great mindfulness is or kind of what it does, not useful. <laughs> you bring people together and all they do is actually practice. They get introduced to the practice. They do the practice, they talk about the practice, very useful. A piece of the time. So I know ours is a one-off event and usually you guys are practicing together, but um, sometimes a refresher on what's going on in the applied setting can be motivating as well. But for the most part in a formal program, talking about mindfulness is not all that helpful. Just like talking about working out wouldn't be helpful for your body. Um, practicing is helpful. The, the second question was really, well, okay, fine, practice, but how long? How long do we have to have people practice so that it's actually beneficial? So we asked this 
in multiple ways, varying how much time we formally had them do uh, silence, you know, silent practices like mindfulness of breathing or the body scan or open monitoring. Um, and what we found was that about at about 12 minutes a day, uh, three plus times a week, we start seeing tractable benefits. And this is within a four to eight week interval. Um, so that gives us very concrete in a starting point. Then the scalability question really becomes how do we incorporate it? How do we mint trainers, so to speak? to um, have programs being developed and, and utilized throughout the organizational enterprise. And, and there's one key thing we found there, which is context familiarity is the most important thing. If a non-Googler comes in and starts offering training, it's just probably not gonna have the same punch and relevance as somebody who's lived the life of a Googler. Mm. And I think that that's true. That's definitely what we've seen in all the kind of contexts we've worked when with, worked with um, including service members or first responders, even teachers and uh, university settings. So that's some ways to get concrete research-based answers and then move to implement at scale. And I think that implementation, uh, Nick, needs to be across the life cycle of the individual within their career development. And I think that's something the military really prides itself in is systematically and in uh, stepwise developing, you know, the the individual, the small team leader, the larger manager and leader, and eventually, you know, a senior leader. You don't start fitness training at the end of your career. You start it at the beginning. And I think that's the same for this. In fact, many of us would like to see, you know, a program that begins in elementary schools as, as is being started by a number of groups. So people have this uh, understanding of their innate capacity to be mindful at a very early age. Mm, that's great. You know, I had a couple of questions that are coming in from uh, guests that I would like to get to in just a second. But Eric, you know, while we're while we're speaking to you about this topic, you know, one of the things I'm really curious about is like, what is the future of programs like this in the military as far as what you can see? Well, I mean, I, I hope I'm not a I'm not a decision maker or a policy maker in the military any longer. I'm, I'm uh, the old soldier. But what I'd like to see is more of what Amishi and others are delivering, which is outcomes-based studies that show that systematic applications, of, and she's done this dose-response curve now. So we can we know that a program manager who says, well, let, let's do mindfulness, let's do this for an hour a week, or mm -hmm. let's do it for an hour a month, or let's give a lecture on this, you know, by a visiting, you know, guru. We know that's not going to work. Yeah. It, it's experiential. Uh, any good program has to begin uh, and has to focus on the experience of it. Uh, there's a little bit of the didactics, as, as Mishi said, just so that you understand some of the, the, the core of it. But it really rests on the individual become comfortable and practiced with it and going through the exasperation of, of learning that, guess what? We're mind monitoring even in the midst of, of being ta taught how to do this. And then measure the outcomes uh, in such a way that um, the, the true program managers and, and policy makers understand how it can be codified effectively. No, that's very great. Thank you. You know, and if we could pull up uh, Manali Shah's uh, question here, she mentions, are there norms you created with teams you worked with to allow and enable people who, to really be present to that moment uh, or to really be in that moment? It seems that we re reward busyness and multitasking in our corporate cultures. And there's maybe there's an alternative to that. Well, first of all, I want to say, hi, Manali. I know her. <laughs> and I just recently learned that she's Amishi, a good Amishi knows everybody. <laughs> and a great question. I would say that, you know, just like Eric was describing, there's so many different ways within an, in a complex and, uh, and large organization that we want to try to figure out how mindfulness can be introduced. There has to be some kind of through line. Mm -hmm. So that's at the entry stages and then kind of percolates throughout uh, to senior leadership. And the way in which the mindfulness uh, is, is contextualized is gonna differ for each of those stages. We just, Eric was uh, involved in a project we were doing with basic combat training. These are people that aren't even soldiers yet. And the way that we introduce mindfulness to them is very different than strategic leaders at the Pentagon. So contextualizing it appropriately is key. But I think some of these aspects of uh, cultural um, norms that start getting established, like you should be multitasking all the time, um, and, or that 
you know, to be a good leader, you need to focus on your communication instead of your ability to listen. Or, you know, that it's more important to try to get things done instead of doing things right. That kind of, all those kind of things need to happen as part of the through line. And it's not just that they're going to inform norms. It's going to inform how people can achieve the new norms that you want to. So, for example, in the teams context, we're just starting a project where we're looking at small teams uh, within the military context to see how team cohesion can be benefited with mindfulness practice. And some of those practices have to do with making clear the downside of multitasking. Mm. Having leaders and having other team members say, when you can monotask or unitask, do so. And let's save the time that we have to do multiple things when we need each other, because we're gonna need to go back and forth. You're gonna need to do your own task and then interact with me. So there's a, a privileging of when that, that resource needs to be expended. And then also knowing what situation you're in requires mindfulness to be, even be aware of the, what the moment is requiring right now and where your uh, mind may be. So, I mean, that's sort of a, just a preliminary answer. And we're starting to look at practices that can be actually offered two teams together mm -hmm. to get better able to do that so that conclusion is improved. Yeah, and, and I would I would add to that. I, I mean, this is a my re, my immediate and maybe too facile response is when I hear that teams are being asked to multitask and be uh, multiply directed, I wonder about the leaders. Maybe they're just too unfocused to be able to deliver to teams a more more a more focused uh, goal or set yeah. of goals. That's a really good point. You know, there's a there's another question here by Sophia that I'd love to pull up as well. Uh, she asks, you know, how can we remind ourselves to have mindfulness on top of the mind, on top of mind in this new virtual environment that we're all becoming uh, used to, and in a lot of cases, overwhelming. Uh, it, we're finding it to be overwhelming at times. You know, how do we balance those things and keep mindfulness uh, top of mind? Well, I think this is a this is a this takes discipline. I mean, one of the most mindful friends that I had surrounded by an electronic universe um, was highly focused in his attention to things that were important to him. And, and, and I realized this one day in sitting in his office and having his phone going off all the time that he either didn't answer that phone or if he answered the phone because he thought and knew it was important, he would say very gently and very, um, you know, uh, deliberately, I can't talk right now. Mm -hmm. I'm, I've got something more important or something very important going on, not necessarily more important, but important going on, but I'll get back to you. And then he made a point of getting back to them. Mm -hmm. So that was, and I realized after the fact that that was an extraordinarily mindful uh, display that he made, he didn't allow this environment to distract. I think too often, uh, Sophia, we allow the electronic universe we live in to be distracting of us, we still are in control. Yeah, that's the thing to remember that the flashlight can be guided, but the <laughs> flashlight can also be yanked. I mean, you can, it's very hard to think of your phone pinging and you not turning to look. That's your attention being pulled by the lure of that. And so if you're going to um, allow those notifications to be present, sometimes you have to, you have no choice, uh, to be aware that your attention is going to get moved around in this way. And then use, just as Eric described with his uh, colleague, then have the next level be where the mindfulness comes in. Okay, fine, my attention may get yanked by this, but what I knew do next is within my control. Meaning, am I going to pick up the phone? Am I going to answer the phone? And I'll tell you that, especially in the context of things like driving, I mean, we just need to be better able to do this because um, everybody's safety is on the line. Uh, and frankly, in the context of a corporate setting, the success of our work is on the line. And Farah, uh, the last comment that we have here uh, from Farah actually, I think maybe touches on this. It's in the form of a question. She asks, you know, what are some practices that one can adopt to be more in tune with our mindfulness and try to mitigate that disruption? And I think Amishi, you were actually just kind of touching on that a little bit here in terms of managing our distractions, managing our, our choices, and how we're directing our attention. And maybe we could just speak to that uh, a little bit before we end here. That's a big one. I mean, I think the first thing I'll say is um, establishing a personal mindfulness practice for a short period every day uh, is going to be key because then you have these resources available to you. It's almost like, you know, think about if you were 
in your garage and you had to put a heavy box on a top shelf, right? That's not a, the right moment to just drop to the ground and start doing some push-ups. <laughs> you need to have intrinsic strength to be able to manage the current situation. So that's the first thing I'd say is these are not going to be quick fixes. This is a capacity that you need to cultivate. Thankfully, it doesn't seem like it takes all that long to do it. Like I said, something like 12 minutes uh, a day can, can get you started. Um, so start there is the first thing I'll say. And then I think actually I would like to hear from Eric some of his tips on what you might do during your, during your work day. You well, I, you well, I think, I think uh, I'd encourage everybody to take a Mishi's course, but that would, that would, that would entail uh, recruiting or uh, joining the army. <laughs> <laughs> no, no uh, seriously. I think as you pointed out, once you understand the, the fundamentals of this, you can begin to work in mindful episodes throughout your day, whether that's a small, a short pause that you take. You know, I've often heard people talk about doing it at a red light. Rather than turn the radio up or intensify a conversation in the car, do a mindful exercise. I mean, uh, there are so many, any source of random um, sensory input, whether it's sound or the, the wind blowing on your skin or the colors of leaves are all, um, you know, um, substrate for the grist of a mindful, uh, mindfulness exercise. It doesn't have to be in a room with, you know, with, with funny music going on and, and, and incense burning. It can be done multiple times throughout the day. And I think, Amishi, over time, there is some work and you know more than I do that you can break this up into multiple smaller episodes when you are experienced at doing this. Yeah. But I would still say the longer periods of continuous. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm not discounting that. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And I think the one you were describing the stop practice is a great one. Stop, take a breath, observe, proceed. That's mm -hmm. an easy one to do at a stoplight. So unfortunately, we're at the top of the hour, which means we're at time. And I just want to be attentive to our attention and our time. But uh, for folks that might be interested in following up and learning more about your work, Amishi or Eric, your adventures in this in this field, where are the best places for people to be directed to find more information? For me, it's easy. If you remember my name, A-M-I-S-H-I dot com, you can find all my labs research and um, learn about what we're up to. Well, all of these have been my personal observations. They don't reflect the, the, the policies or the, the thoughts of the DOD or the VA, but I would recommend the VA, the Veterans Administration, has a very strong emphasis now on mindfulness. You can go to VA and Whole Health, and there is a whole uh, bunch of resources on mindfulness because it's at the centerpiece of, of uh, integrative, uh, holistic whole health. That's wonderful. Well, thank you so much both for your insights and your work in this field. Obviously, there's so much more work for us all to be doing here, but it's encouraging to know that there is so much effort being put into organizations, both big and small. Uh, so thank you so much for your time and your attention and be well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.